This is New Day Northwest. Now from the Premier of Blue Cross Studio, here's Margaret Larson. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to New Day Northwest. We start today with a congresswoman who's endured much more than her share of challenges. Perhaps the most dramatic was as a young attorney working for Congressman Leo Ryan when she was shot five times and horrifically wounded during the Jonestown massacre in Guyana. She's lived through love and loss and fought hard for women's rights and protections from the very beginning and so much more. Please welcome the author of Undaunted, Congresswoman Jackie Speed. It's an honor to meet oh, you. Thank you, Margaret. Thanks very much. It's great to be with you. Um, the book's coming out now in part because it's almost the 40th anniversary. It is the 40th. Of yesterday, yesterday. Yesterday was the 40th anniversary. On, wow. Um, does it seem like that much time has passed? What do you reflect on when that day comes? You know, every um, anniversary date, I normally take it off, no matter what day of the week it is. I go to the cemetery and take flowers to Leo Ryan's grave. And I take the day off so I take the time to realize how precious life is because it's so easy in our frenetic pace of life to forget that um, we're not guaranteed a tomorrow. And I learned that when I was quite young, uh, lying on that airstrip with five bullets in me. Um, you lost a piece of your leg the size of a football. Uh, you somehow managed to stand up and move yourself wounded that badly. Uh, you ran for office while you were still recovering from all of that. I, I'm, I know that grit's the most important thing for people to have in life, but how do you marshal yourself under those circumstances? Well, for me, it was emotional. It was, it was actually therapy because I realized if I didn't get on with my life, that I would spend the rest of my life as a victim of this horrific tragedy in Jonestown. And so it, I did it because I wanted to um, make sure that Congressman Ryan's legacy was pursued, but also to personally just move on and stop being so um, centered around my pain and suffering. And it worked. It worked. To because, serve others mm -hmm. in the way that you knew how. You eventually won his seat in Congress, which is so amazing, brings <clears throat> a tear to my eye. Um, and you write in this book about things we never used to talk about. You talked about your relationship with your parents. Your mom was pretty tough, but they did move to a good school when you wanted to go to That's a good right. school. I thought that, that was very impressive, but a long line of tough women who prevailed and went through this you know, unbelievable experience, were widowed while pregnant with a second child. You talk about sexual abuse at the hands of your grandfather. And I, in this moment, even though we're living through Me Too and we're all kind of confronting those things, um, it's a lot to come out with that in public. Why, why were you willing to share? Well, you know, I had so suppressed it all of my life. I was really good at, at compartmentalizing it. And as I was writing the book, I was trying to understand why was I so passionate about issues around rape in the military, rape on college campuses, yeah. um, the Me Too movement. And then it just dawned on me. It dated back to being a victim of sexual abuse as a child. and. I think it's important that we do talk about it because it happens a lot. Yeah. And we need to uh, you know, fortify our kids. We need to do whatever is necessary to protect them and to be alert to it and to make people realize that it, it impacts many families. It's one of those things, <clears throat> I think, over this last year or two that we've heard so much about that I have been surprised, even people I've known for 20 or 30 years, there were things I didn't know mm -hmm. that had happened to them. Um, and maybe the gift we can give to girls and women now is to be able to say and be believed. And the Me Too movement is part of that. You know, for the longest time, if you were sexually harassed, you didn't talk about it because no one would believe you. And part of the message, certainly, that I have and that I've made uh, front and center in Congress is we do believe you. Mm -hmm. We believe Christine Blasey Ford. We believe all the women who were sexually harassed in the Capitol. And we're not going to allow these cases to be swept under the rug and have taxpayers picking up the tab for members who conduct themselves in that manner. And you had this happen to you as well. I did. It was a chief of staff to Congressman Ryan who one night uh, we were working late and he put me up against the wall and kissed me and stuck his tongue down my throat and I, you know, I recoiled. Now, it never happened again and I stayed clear of him, but you should be able to work and be safe. That's the message. And that, not have to think about things like that. Right. And we all for so many years have said, what did I 
do or say or somehow indicate this was welcome. And it turns out <laughs> we shouldn't have been thinking about no. it that way at all. And if we can do anything to change that, it would be you know, pretty amazing. Uh, the loss of your husband while you were pregnant, you write really touchingly about the way your girlfriends you know, get, came together and helped. And you said that you know, grief is a pretty frightening obstacle. And there are lots of people who are dealing with grief or trauma right now. What, looking back on it, what can you tell us about where to go to tend and befriend, as they say? So I, that was the lowest point in my life. I can only imagine. And I, I almost didn't want to continue to live. But I so had sorry. a five and a half year old son and I'm pregnant with our second child. And I gave myself permission to stay in bed one day. But I said, I'm gonna promise myself I'll get up tomorrow. So you've gotta give yourself some um, latitude but then you have to get up. And for me, I talk about the three Fs. I survive because of family, friends, and faith. And we are not good in, a, in our society of reaching out to people in need because we don't know what to do. And so it's really incumbent on the, the person with the grief to ask, to, to seek help. You know, when my husband was killed, uh, I was three months from personal bankruptcy. I, I was. I, it couldn't have been a more perfect storm, losing my husband, um, have, being pregnant with this high-risk pregnancy, and then being three months from personal bankruptcy. And I brought together an attorney friend, my accountant, uh, personal friends to just help me get through it. You got your team together. Yes. <laughs> you and called we, in the cavalry. We I need did. to learn to do that. You also wrote about a pregnancy loss that was something that you've spoken about publicly to help, um, I got the impression, maybe some of your male colleagues to understand better about what women face. So it was a, a second trimester um, miscarriage that was an abortion. And we were sitting on the floor and my colleagues on the other side of the aisle um, were trying to um, cut funding to Planned Parenthood at the time. and. This one member was reading from a book and talking about how the fetus was having the leg sawed off of it. And I just recoiled from it. And I was actually going to speak about something very different. And then I got up and I said, how dare you speak about something you know nothing about? You know, the, the expectation that somehow that you carry a fetus for that long and cavalierly end it is just not real. That's not that's not the way it is. And so it was, it, it was a, a, a very important moment to bring um, clarity to an issue that doesn't always get the kind of clarity it deserves. I had women colleagues on the floor come up to me afterwards, whisper in my ear, I had one too. Um, it, it is, um, women get saddled with, um, so many responsibilities to deal with issues that we should be able to speak openly about because it, you know, it does take two. You wouldn't know it from some of the conversations, but that is true. <laughs> um, there's a new Congress coming that is, it's not 51% women as we are in the population, but we are more represented than we have been. What is your thought about what might be different as a result of that? So we will jump from 19% to 23% in the House and the Senate. Uh, I think it's, it's so refreshing to see so many women get elected. 34 new members are women. Uh, 22 of them have never held office before. So part of what we've seen is a, a, a strength and power in women coming forward saying, this is not the way I want my country to be run. And so I think we're going to see some, some great leadership and a recognition that uh, we have got to make equality really stick this time and that the issues that our country faces are our family issues as well. And uh, I'm going to be possibly chairing the military personnel subcommittee. Well, one of the issues I want to talk about is the family 
that serves along with right. the service member. Right along with them. And that's been true for so long, but now that we have such a small percentage of people actually serving mm -hmm. with these repeat deployments, that's more important than ever. The book is wonderful. I'm just so glad you wrote it, and thank I took you. so much from it personally that um, I thank you for that and for your service. Oh, thank you, Margaret. Appreciate it. We'll be right back.